Well, I'm sure that those enclave holotapes I made were a lot for you to take in, but now there's arguably even more for you to digest. Today, Traveller, I tell you of my ancient enemy. The Enclave's ancient enemy, who have a long history that, by this point, spans over 210 years. Today, and for the foreseeable future, we are discussing the Brotherhood of Steel. You will know the Brotherhood of Steel, those militant metal men and women, taking an oath to confiscate and preserve all pre-war technology deemed too dangerous to be in the hands of a common prospector. They've had a long road, of isolationism, of covert operations, of division, and of dominance. This I have learned through my many years fighting them, as well as logs and tales from the wasteland I have heard over the last 20 to 30 years. Without further ado, this is the full story of the Brotherhood of Steel. Our story begins in the years leading up to atomic annihilation, with a member of the United States Army named Roger Maxson. Maxson was a loyal soldier who was dispatched on a mission to the Mariposa military base to assist in the defense and monitoring of some of the scientific experiments going on there. Mere weeks before the end of the world as Maxson knew it, he and his squad mates would discover something. Something horrifying. Something terrifying. Something so dark it would twist men's minds and break them. What Maxson and his squad found was the scientists working at the Mariposa military base had been conducting experimentation on human subjects, prisoners of war no less. The Chinese, if captured during the conflict in the Sino-American War, were often sent to concentration camps by the American military. What people didn't know was that these government officials were shipping prisoners away for experimentation. Maxson happened to be one of the men who discovered this grim horror. It was days after this event that their leader would commit suicide due to the horror he had witnessed, leaving Roger Maxson in charge of his squad. He declared full desertion of the base and the United States military as a whole, disgusted and enraged at his leaders for these brutal and horrific violations of human rights laws. He received no response from any personnel, and three days later, the Great War would start and end. The world was plunged into a nuclear apocalypse. Cities, once blossoming with life, were now barren, desolate wreckages. Vault doors beneath the surface lay sealed with the inhabitants comfortably tucked inside, blissfully unaware they were also now a part of the Enclave's schemes to unethically test and experiment on them. Survivors banded together as groups of hope or groups of greed. Raider groups formed from the ashes. People's faces began to peel off as they succumbed to the radiation, becoming what was later known by the wider wasteland as a ghoul. During the carnage, however, Mariposa military base lay untouched, protected by the protocols in place to preserve inhabitants from if this exact situation was to happen. Maxson and his men waited out in the bunker for a few days, before sending a scout to observe the damage. Radiation was non-lethal in the area surrounding the base, so they buried the corpses of the executed scientists outside, not like they deserved a proper funeral. Maxson and his troops then proceeded to seal up Mariposa military base for what they thought would be for good, hoping to let the horrors in that place decay and fall into disrepair. Little did he know that sometime in the future, the military base would be more alive than ever. Maxson then led the group of soldiers and their families into a fallout bunker codenamed Lost Hills. The journey was long and perilous, with lots of deaths and injuries along the way. One of these even being Maxson's wife. One month after the detonations, they made it to the bunker. After taking some time to get the injured settled and unpack all that they had brought with them, Maxson called for everyone's attention, and it was at this very moment that he announced the organization of the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood of Steel were to be a faction that collected, utilized, and preserved the technology of the old world, whether that was for safekeeping or so power-hungry elders could use it to start a new world order is up for debate and is one of the major flaws with the Brotherhood of Steel. If we entrust these people with the technology of the Wasteland and the Old World, who's to say that they will not use it against the people of the Wasteland and attempt to start a fascist regime? Some questions are better left for history to answer for. Now, allow me to share my thoughts on this point in Brotherhood history. 
As much as I have hated the Brotherhood in my past, and as much pain as they have caused me, and I to them, Roger Markson is someone I highly respect. He had the courage and the opportunity to fight back against the organization which would later become the Enclave. I spent much time studying the Brotherhood's documented history when I was in my service, and after a while I... I grew to respect Markson, even adore him for his actions. I tried my very best to simulate this courage when dealing with my own situation, However, it wasn't until I was backed into a corner and had no choice that I acted upon my desires and lost everyone I loved in the process. I digress. Enough about me and my personal feelings on the matter. Let us continue our story. Not much was documented on the Brotherhood of Steel's early years following their inception in 2077. The latest logged event which I'm in possession of is 2134, almost 50 years after the Brotherhood's inception which depicts a roguish member of the Brotherhood, who wishes, to the disagreement of the Elders, to travel to an abandoned West Tech facility, which he believed to be ripe with technology to scavenge. This was the first time that we've seen a group of members in the Brotherhood of Steel go against their own faction and create somewhat of an outcast group, and it certainly isn't going to be the last. This West Tech facility that this member spoke of was famously known as the Glow among Wastelanders. Its name derived from the fact a Chinese nuclear bomb decimated the site. The fate of the Brotherhood's defects is quite obvious. Around a year after this event, Roger Maxim would sadly pass away to cancer, and his son would take his place as High Elder of the Brotherhood of Steel. Around this time, the Brotherhood would be organised into a ranking system which correlated with the logo of the faction. The insignia of the Brotherhood of Steel is a sword with gears surrounding the blade, a circle encasing the gears and the blade, with a pair of wings rising from the sword's guard area. Each of the aforementioned pieces of this icon have meaning, despite what some may believe. The sword is to represent one of the Brotherhood's most notorious ranks, the Paladins. The Paladins were commonly seen as the foot soldiers of the Brotherhood, leading security operations and expeditions across the wasteland. The gears represent three different ranks inside the Brotherhood. The Knight, the Initiate, and the Scribe. The larger gear is for the Knight, which is another type of soldier in the Brotherhood's ranks, a lower rank than the Paladin, meaning Paladins would usually be commanding Knights. Knights also worked as the craftsmen of the Brotherhood of Steel, repairing, tweaking, and maintaining the tech stockpile they had collected and continued to collect, as well as producing new technology from scrap, weapons, power armor, the lot. The Scribe is the Brotherhood of Steel's egghead, having more expansive knowledge of the technology that the Brotherhood of Steel collected and produced. The Scribes are masters at reverse engineering, which comes hand in hand with the Knight's craftsmanship, making the gears turn, if you will. The final gear is for the Initiate, the most green Brotherhood member, a rookie fresh off the press. The Initiate has no particular role at this rank, however is placed under training by the Brotherhood of Steel to become either a Scribe or a Knight. The Circle represents unity within the Brotherhood, however also has a sub-faction behind it. A covert-like organization named the Circle of Steel, who were to deal with internal Brotherhood matters such as rogue members. It is unknown whether this was a sub-faction originating in Lost Hills or in the Mojave chapter's Hidden Valley Bungas. And finally, we have the Wings, the part of the Brotherhood's insignia that sends the message to those informed of the insignia's meaning that the Brotherhood of Steel's goal is to bring hope and deliver a possibility of restoration for humanity. A new world of peace. If you'd believe that. The Wings are representing one of the highest ranks in the Brotherhood of Steel, the Elder. Elders were originally a council of Brotherhood of Steel members back at Lost Hills, which eventually were sent off to their own chapters and other areas outside of California, their rank and purpose staying the same. The Elder was a member who made the decisions on behalf of the entire Brotherhood of Steel chapter they were with, whether that be assisting Wastelanders, repairing a death machine for scientific purposes, or going into lockdown after a heart-shattering defeat. Other ranks that were introduced at a later date or are not represented on the symbol of the Brotherhood of Steel include the Squires, who are very young initiates, the Sentinel, who outranks nearly everyone bar the Elder, as well as the Head, 
Star, and other smaller and higher ranks of the Scribe, Knight, and Paladin. In the 2150s, the Brotherhood spent a lot of their time dedicating resources and troopers to pinning down some of the surrounding area under Brotherhood control. During this time, a raider group known as the Vipers were also dominating some of the areas south of Lost Hills, as well as raiding more frequently. As you will know from my own holotape, I have a history with the Vipers. This is long before my time though. This activity caught the attention of the Brotherhood of Steel, who dispatched a force to deal with the group led by Elder Maxon. The Brotherhood severely underestimated the sheer ferocity of this group, and when the Elder's helmet was off, he was killed by a poison arrow. The Elder's death sent a fiery rage into the hearts of the Brotherhood's paladins and knights, and now Head Paladin Rhombus was determined to squash this pathetic raider group. Rhombus succeeded, and within a month, the Vipers were all nearly destroyed. Spare for some who fled to places like the Mojave Wasteland and its surrounding areas. It was during this time that the Brotherhood struck up excellent business relations with the caravans of the Hub, who from around 2155 ran routine caravans to Lost Hills. Around six years on from the Viper campaign, a Brotherhood patrol came across something bizarre in the Badlands. A large green man lay dead in the sands, a sight which caused the paladins and knights present to become confused, distressed. They took the corpse of this thing back to Lost Hills, where the scribes would study and dissect the creature. It was determined by head scribe Vri that this thing was sterile, unable to reproduce. The creature remained a mystery for about a year, until the presence of a man regarded as legend in the wasteland would turn up at the Brotherhood of Steel's HQ. The Traveller, who originated from Vault 13, was sent to the same place that the first outcast group went, recognised as the Glow, by the command of the soldiers there. The glow was certain death for anyone who were unprepared. However, this vault dweller, he made it back alive with the information regarding the Rogue Brotherhood squad that went there so long ago. The vault dweller was welcomed into Lost Hills where the Brotherhood of Steel were given the truth about the strange green being they had found a while back. The creature was the result of the forced evolutionary virus, which had been utilized by the master to create an army of super mutants who were going to be made from all human survivors in the wasteland. High Elder Maxon was convinced by the Vault Dweller, in which he sent a force to the Mariposa military base, where they had originated, to locate and terminate the FEV Vats. With the assistance of Maxon's Brotherhood, the master of the super mutant race was defeated, and the Vault Dweller was never to be seen again in the wasteland, at least of the Brotherhood. Following the Master's defeat, the Brotherhood decided to aid some of the surrounding settlements from surviving super mutant and nightkin bands, as well as becoming more focused on advanced technological research. As the NCR was being formed, the NCR had very good relations with the Brotherhood at Lost Hills, though Lost Hills was never claimed to be a part of NCR territory. During these years, however, the Brotherhood of Steel's influence began to deteriorate in New California, which placed the Brotherhood of Steel into a state of stagnancy. During this period of stagnancy, the Brotherhood were made aware of a faction that outranked them in technological superiority, one that posed an active threat to the Wasteland. In order to tackle this new threat, named the Enclave, this meant the Brotherhood would have to go unseen. The Brotherhood repaired and reactivated many networks and outposts across New California, and were able to go undetected on Enclave servers for quite some time, collecting data and information about their mysterious group. After their defeat at the hands of the Chosen One, the Brotherhood were left without an enemy, and there was nothing more the Brotherhood could do in this time to aid any factions or fight off any threats, and so the decision was made to send a chapter under the command of future Elder Owen Lyons to the East in the 2250s. Jumping back a little bit, Jeremy Maxon was the Elder of the Brotherhood of Steel as of 2231, nine years before the Enclave operations, and his policies included trying to get the Brotherhood out of their stagnant period by aggressively hoarding technology, taking it from the lesser people in Jeremy's eyes. It's people like Jeremy Markson that make the Brotherhood a bigger threat than they are a force for good. His outlook on things not only shattered relations and started wars, but if the Brotherhood got their way, it could have resulted in a regime with the Brotherhood of Steel at the head, using fear of advanced tech that the Brotherhood had to keep citizens in line. 
This is why I'll forever see the Brotherhood as a double-edged sword. And despite my service to the Enclave in my past, I'll always see their handling of the Brotherhood as something the Enclave almost got right. However, that doesn't mean everyone in the Brotherhood's a maniac, and I suppose you could say the same for the Enclave, though there are a few. I digress. Getting back on track, Jeremy's actions shattered relations with the NCR, leading to an all-out war, which would spread many territories in the future. But that's a story for another day. Now that the California chapter and the Origins have been covered, it's time to move to the different known chapters in the Wasteland. Now, let's get back to the chapter of the Brotherhood that were dispatched eastward in the 2250s, led by Elder Lions. The chapter was sent away from Lost Hills for a handful of reasons. The first was to investigate Washington DC, otherwise known as the Capital Wasteland, which was once the capital of the USA back before the Great War. With this knowledge, there was bound to be some excellent technology that the Brotherhood could get their hands on. Some that could assist in the resurgence in Brotherhood power and getting them out of stagnancy. Another of these goals was to investigate the rumoured reports of super mutant activity in the area, whether that may be the remnants of the Unity, or possibly an entirely different breed of mutant, native to DC. No matter what the case was, the super mutant threat lived on, and so Lions and his Brotherhood of Steel chapter were to put a stop to it. The final of their objectives was to establish contact with the missing Midwestern Brotherhood of Steel chapter, a chapter which was sent to the Midwest some time ago but seemingly lost contact with Lost Hills and any Brotherhood personnel. Contact with the Midwestern chapter was unsuccessful, and so only two objectives were left in place. Find the Capital Wasteland, and find the Super Mutant Threat. On their travels, the Brotherhood discovered a horrifying sight. A smog-filled city, struck by three irradiated rivers and filled with raiders and sick people, stood before Lyons' Brotherhood. They called it The Pit. This is where Lyons and his chapter initiated an event known as The Scourge. Not much is known about this event, but what is known is that it saw the Brotherhood rescue a large batch of children from the city, later recruiting them into the Brotherhood of Steel's ranks. Only one casualty is reported, that of a Brotherhood initiate named Asher, who allegedly was crushed under falling debris. Though rumour has it he survived. Finally, after a long time of travelling, the Brotherhood made it to the capital wasteland and established a base of operations in the Pentagon, now known as the Citadel. Brotherhood discovered many things in the Citadel, and one of these things was a large, disassembled robot, Liberty Prime. More on him later. Over the next few years, the Brotherhood of Steel became quite a large figurehead in the capital wasteland. Despite the suffering in DC, Lion's orders were clear. Acquire advanced technology first and foremost, and deal with the super mutant threat, which had proven itself no longer a rumour, as super mutants infested the city ruins. The people of the capital wasteland were in dire need of protection and help, whether that be from raiders, super mutants, ghouls or otherwise. And Lyons noticed this. Lyons knew this. It was at this moment that he struck away from his original orders to make sure the people of the wasteland were protected, to the dismay or the joy of his soldiers. This new mission from Lyons was at first hidden from Lost Hills, but no secret can be hidden forever. Soon enough, Lyons outright denied to follow the orders from Lost Hills, which saw his chapter excommunicated, denied of any reinforcements, supplies, or support from the West Coast. The Capital Wasteland chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel were on their own. This signaled to those under Lyons' command that disagreed with his motives that it was time to go. This group of disgruntled Brotherhood members raided the Citadel stockpile and left the Citadel for good forming a new faction named the Brotherhood of Steel Outcasts. The Outcasts are a topic for another day, but are similar to the same Outcasts that went to the glow in the early days back in Lost Hills. As the fight against the Super Mutants continued, an old enemy of the Brotherhoods would emerge once more. The Enclave were back, and their blood was boiling for a fight. The Enclave had first attempted to take the nearby Jefferson Memorial water purifier under their control but were pushed back by radioactive activity coming from the control center, which was the fault of James. James was an ally of the Brotherhood of Steel. He and Madison Lee, 
one of his companions, were trying to work on a way to purify the water of the capital wasteland, though to little success before James's child was born. Shortly after the Enclave's reappearance, Lyons declared war on them over the purifier, a war which I will touch on in the near future. From 2278, the Brotherhood's East Coast chapter would have a hard time finding someone capable of leading the Brotherhood after Elder Lion's death. This would change, however, as a headstrong Elder would eventually find his foothold as a successful leader of the East Coast Brotherhood of Steel, and end up leading his brothers and sisters into the Commonwealth sometime in the future. For now, however, let's jump back west. Much like Lion's being sent to recover advanced technology to the East, Elder Elijah was sent to Hoover Dam to secure it with another chapter later becoming known as the Mojave Chapter. This chapter was the result of a series of disagreements, however, as Elijah wasn't too popular with the more conservative side of the Brotherhood of Steel. Where a majority of the Brotherhood of Steel members wanted to preserve older technologies, Elijah wanted to expand further, develop new weapons, new technology, a motivation that a large majority of the Brotherhood found concerning due to the large majority of Elijah's ideas being highly unethical, and instead of dealing with Elijah, they sent him and a chapter in search of Hubadam. Upon arriving in the Mojave, however, they were too late. The New California Republic, who they had previously been warring with, had taken the dam. Elijah was infuriated, but realized there was nothing he could do. Instead, he turned his attention to the nearby Helios 1, a solar power facility. It was during this time that Elijah's true nature began to shine, a non-caring, psychopathic madman who was unfit to serve as an elder of the Brotherhood of Steel. While the Van Graffs grew in strength and became a greater concern to the Brotherhood, Elijah ordered his men to ignore them, instead focusing on getting Helios back up and running and holding a defense against increasing NCR forces in the Mojave. Soon enough, the NCR decided to enact upon an operation codenamed Sunburst, which resulted in a bloody battle between the NCR and the Brotherhood of Steel, one which I'm going to cover soon in another holotape. Operation Sunburst pushed the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel into the Hidden Valley bunkers, an array of fallout shelters nearby to Helios 1. Elijah had mysteriously disappeared, thought dead in the action, leaving Elder McNamara in charge, who initiated the chapter-wide lockdown of the Mojave chapter, one which would only permit scouts to leave the bunker. The Lost Hills Brotherhood of Steel had doomed their own when they sent Elijah with a group of men he saw as nothing but expendable equipment into the Mojave. Even after Operation Sunburst, Elijah's reign of terror was not over, as he left a trail that caught the scent of the aforementioned Circle of Steel. The organization dispatched one of their knights, Christine, to track Elijah down. I plan to go in-depth on Christine's mission in this series as well as Elijah's moves after the Battle of Helios 1. If this piques your interest, Traveller, be sure to stay tuned for that. And finally, we get to the most recent happenings in the Brotherhood of Steel's history. The Capital Wasteland chapter, after defeating the Enclave for good in the Capital Wasteland at least, claimed Adam's Air Force Base for their own, and used the materials there to craft a vehicle that had become somewhat of a myth in the Brotherhood's arsenal. Wasteland rumour has it that back before the departure of the missing in action Midwestern chapter, the Brotherhood of Steel had access to an entire fleet of airships that made travelling the wasteland a lot easier. These airships would fly to the east to aid in Lion's future goal of assessing the extent of the super mutant force that remained in the wasteland. These airships would mysteriously disappear in a great storm that would eventually send the capital airship housing the future Midwestern chapter crashing near Chicago. Allow me to preface this by saying, this is only a wild wasteland tale I heard, and no evidence has been found to point towards this. However, the same airship idea was utilised by the Capital Wasteland chapter, in which construction began on an airship that planned to surpass the supposed original design if there was one. They called it the Pridwin. Construction began in 2278, and the earliest model was finished by as late as 2282. During the time that the Pridwin was being perfected for travel, three recon squadrons were dispatched to Boston, now known as the Commonwealth, to search for more advanced tech. The third and final recon team, as late as 2287, dispatched an emergency signal to now Elder Maxon regarding the source of advanced signals coming from the mysterious technologically advanced faction named the Institute. 
It was with this message that Elder Maxon and his forces would depart from Adams Air Force Base and arrive in the Commonwealth. Shortly after the arrival of the Pridwin in the Commonwealth, the Brotherhood would begin their occupation of the feral ghoul infested Boston Airport, which was proven a difficult task. Nonetheless, this mighty chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel prevailed, and would continue to use the Boston Airport as a headquarters. Many different objectives were made clear for the Brotherhood of Steel during their time in the Commonwealth. Proctors, a new rank established, required technical documents to further boost knowledge of native technology the Brotherhood may be interested in, dealing with threats like ghouls and super mutants, as well as this new enemy they were faced with. For the discovery and attack on the Institute, the Brotherhood of Steel would need lots of firepower, as well as a way to track where they were. Of course, Liberty Prime came to mind, who was destroyed by the Enclave during the Adams Air Force Base campaign. It is unknown to me if their efforts were fruitful. Without further delay, I highlighted many of the major conflicts in Brotherhood of Steel history in my last holotape, so I think it's best we start from the very first documented conflict I'm in possession of. The first documented war I have of the Brotherhood of Steel is with that of the Vipers. The Vipers were religious, zealous raiders and fiends who originated from Vault 15 alongside the future New California Republic, Jackals and Great Khans. The Vipers in particular believed in a snake god after their leader in 2097 had a religious epiphany after falling into a pit of mutated vipers. Their venom had mutated, and instead of killing those inflicted by it, enlightened them to a higher being, according to these raiders. They then swore to sacrifice any and all wastelanders who wandered too close to their pit, in return for wealth, glory, and purpose. As the Brotherhood of Steel had just finished up establishing themselves as one of the major powers in California in the 2150s, with Lost Hills and the surrounding areas claimed as Brotherhood territory, the Vipers had a little base of their own, a little bit too close to Brotherhood soil. This Viper base was located in the Badlands to the south of Lost Hills, and the Vipers presumably used this base to spread their influence and their ability to prey on unsuspecting victims. Whether the Brotherhood of Steel saw this as a threat to them, or the Wasteland at large, is up for debate. No matter their intentions with engaging with the Vipers, their goal was all the same. To push back, and at most eradicate, the Vipers, and get them off Brotherhood turf. When the time came for action, High Elder Maxon took only a few squads of scouts with him to hunt down these Viper troublemakers. This was due to Maxon seeing them as nothing more but a group of crazed tribals that with the mighty and powerful weapons and soldiers at the Brotherhood of Steel's disposal, they could make short work of. Maxon and his squad then located the Vipers finally, and expected them to turn and run at the sight of the T-51B power armor that the soldiers were wearing, and the heavy weaponry that they wielded. However, the Vipers' sheer zealous nature prevented them from doing so, and they began to engage with the Brotherhood troops. Maxon was killed in this battle when his helmet was off by a poison arrow shot from the bow of one of the Vipers killing him in just a few short hours and leaving the Brotherhood of Steel without a leader, that being until John Maxon took the role of High Elder. Paladin Rhombus was promoted to Head Paladin and was heavily involved in the campaign that was planned to avenge their previous Elder. This new campaign formulated by the Paladins of the Brotherhood of Steel, with Paladin Rhombus at the head of this operation, saw a month-long extermination of the Viper forces. The Brotherhood more than likely made short work of this base to the south of Lost Hills, decimated their origin point at the snake pit out in the desert, and left the zealots scattered. During this campaign, a group of paladins was sent to the hub, a nearby settlement, to track down any survivors, which saw the traders in the caravans of the hub become acquainted with the Brotherhood of Steel for the first time, and opening trade relations and trade routes to Lost Hills. Meanwhile, the Vipers, as seen in my own experience, live on in pockets across the desert, near extinct, 
This Brotherhood victory ensured that not just the Vipers knew, but everyone knew that the Brotherhood of Seal was a force not to be fucked with. Around half a decade or so on from the Viper extermination campaign led by Head Paladin Rhombus, a new threat was slowly beginning to arise. This threat was first discovered by a Brotherhood patrol in the Badlands that stumbled across a big, green creature, humanoid in appearance, dead on the sandy grounds. This puzzled the troops, and so they took it back to the scribes at Lost Hills for dissection and study. Head Scribe Vree led this curious observation of the being they had discovered in the Badlands, and her studies would continue for quite some time. A year or so later, a traveller from Vault 13 was welcomed into Lost Hills, and was searching and sharing information about these strange creatures. The Vault Dweller shared that this being they had discovered one year ago was named a Super Mutant, the result of the forced evolutionary virus which was being utilised to create an army of Super Mutants. Those of which who were subjected to this presumably did not volunteer. Head Scribe Vri, with the help of the Vault Dweller, would conclude her study of the corpse she had found, discovering that these creatures had a flaw in their design. The Super Mutants were unable to reproduce, which meant they had been created by unnatural means. Someone, or something, was creating these abominations and dooming them by not doing the proper research on how they may sustain the bloodline of these creatures. And that person, or that thing, was the Master. High Elder Maxim was convinced by the Vault Dweller's explanation to he and his troops of the Super Mutants in which he sent a force to the Mariposa military base, where both the Brotherhood of Steel and the Super Mutants had originated, to locate and terminate the FEV VATs which presumably were creating these monstrosities. With the assistance of Maxon's Brotherhood, the cathedral in which the Master hid below was destroyed, and the mutant threat was severed. And with this, the Vault Dweller, like I said in the last holotape, completely disappeared, nowhere to be seen. After spending some years mopping up any and all leftover super mutants from the Unity, as well as falling into a stagnant state, the Brotherhood of Steel were finally faced with another foe, one that would take a different approach to possibly defeat. During the time leading up to, and around 2240, the Brotherhood detected frequencies off the mainland, as well as reports of people in unusual power armor and invertebrates. Even if these people were a threat to the Wasteland or the Brotherhood of Steel, the Brotherhood could not deal with them correctly due to their stagnant period, which led to only one other option of handling this new threat, covert operations. The Brotherhood then started spending a lot of their time monitoring this faction's movements, though they were unable to do anything directly themselves. The Brotherhood did this by recovering various relay stations and things of a sort to further boost their ability of spying on this new foe. This faction they were monitoring was the reorganized remnants of the United States government, now going by the alias Enclave. The Brotherhood monitored the Enclave right up to their defeat at the hands of the Chosen One, a relative of the Vault Dweller, leaving them without an enemy once again, and buying them some breathing room to get out of their stagnant period without having to worry about the Enclave being a possible threat to them or the Wasteland. Unknown to the Brotherhood of Steel, however, this was not the end of the Enclave, nor would it be the last time they would encounter each other. Elder Lions, in a chapter later becoming the Capital Wasteland Brotherhood of Steel, were sent east with quite the list of goals which I covered in my last episode, which as they travelled further east got smaller and smaller. One of their primary objectives was to find the rumoured second super mutant wave, a second generation originating someplace in the East, also giving the Brotherhood of Steel the opportunity to branch out to areas of interest such as Washington DC. It took little to no effort for Elder Lion's men to locate the mutants in the capital as they infested the ruins of downtown, as well as having small camps and pockets dotted across the wastes, terrorizing local settlements such as Big Town. The Brotherhood of Steel were able to assist the settlers of the Capital Wasteland by pushing this large force of super mutants back to only the city ruins, meaning that while the city ruins and especially downtown were uninhabitable, the rest of the Wasteland had a fighting chance against the mutants. Too many questions arose from this second wave of super mutants, such as their creation, their origin, and their motive. 
This would become somewhat of an obsession to Elder Lions, and so we set a new objective for his Brotherhood of Steel. To locate the origin point of the Super Mutants, and just like Mariposa before it, terminate the facility. Despite Lion's worry about the Super Mutants, it remained a secondary objective to the Brotherhood, with the recovery of advanced technology still being the focal point of Lion's presence in the Capital Wasteland. Liberty Prime, a large, disassembled, malfunctioning war machine that was left to rust in the bowels of the Pentagon, was one of these technologies that the Brotherhood recovered. However, Liberty Prime and the robot's history even before the Brotherhood's acquisition will be covered in a future episode in this series. The fight against the Super Mutants would be long and arduous, and the Brotherhood of Steel's extermination efforts would be put to a halt with the arrival of an old enemy. With Dr. Lee, the Lone Wanderer, and any and all companions that tagged along with them arriving at the Citadel, revealed the return of an enemy that the Brotherhood of Steel had been monitoring decades ago, but did not have the strength to deal with at the time. The Enclave had returned. A force that had escaped from the Poseidon oil rig explosion had fled to the capital to rebuild, and hid right under the Brotherhood's noses for over 20 years. While their efforts were focused on the Super Mutants, the Enclave were given time to grow stronger. The Enclave had seized the Jefferson Memorial not too far from the Citadel, and posed a threat to the Wasteland and her people once again. It was with this that the Brotherhood made plans and preparations for an assault on the Purifier, which with the help of their big robot Liberty Prime, who although was not field tested just yet, was ready for action nonetheless. Once the assault begins, the Enclave stand no chance with Liberty Prime at the helm, leaving the Enclave defeated, but not entirely lost. A few weeks later, after the water purifier was fully recovered and operational, the Brotherhood's objectives shuffled slightly, with the distribution of clean water to the Wastelanders taking the number one priority spot, and fending off surviving Enclave soldiers was secondary, with all previous missions regarding the mutants and the tech cast aside momentarily. The war with the Enclave was far from over, as the Enclave, despite not having a president or governing body after Raven Rock was destroyed, were using Adams Air Force Base as their last effort in the DC area. The first phase of the Brotherhood's plan was to attack and destroy an Enclave relay station, which while successful, dealt a heavy blow to the Brotherhood of Steel. This relay station was used by Enclave personnel to communicate with other Enclave forces, as well as a powerful orbital strike. The Brotherhood of Steel lost many troopers on their siege on the relay station, and also lost one of their most valuable assets. Liberty Prime was struck down by an orbital strike from the Enclave. This left the Brotherhood troops without a counter to the Enclave's vertebrates. After this, research began on Tesla technology for the Brotherhood, which would act as a better counter towards the vertebrates than even Liberty Prime in some cases. Once a prototype Tesla cannon was developed, the Brotherhood began their assault on Adams Air Force Base. Deep within the Enclave's last bastion, there was a mobile base crawler which had another orbital strike terminal on board, and had the coordinates selected and targeted for various bases and settlements in DC, including the likes of Megaton and Rivet City, but was activated to target the mobile base crawler and the surrounding Air Force Base instead. Yet another victory against the Enclave in the Capital Wasteland was secured under the Brotherhood's belt, and in the decade or so that followed, the Brotherhood of Steel would occupy the Air Force Base and utilize its many capabilities to build the Pridwin, an airship which would become just as valuable of an asset to the Brotherhood than possibly even Liberty Prime, but that is up for debate. Not much is known about what caused the conflict between the New California Republic and the Brotherhood of Steel, only Wasteland rumors. Some point to Jeremy Maxson, but there's little to no proof of that happening. What we do know is that sometime before 2274, three years after I managed to wipe the Steel heads out, or so I thought, something happened between the Brotherhood of Steel and the NCR that shook up their relations and made their troopers hostile towards each other. This conflict was seen throughout the Mojave and presumably parts of California, which was not assisted by the brutal and insane leadership of Elder Elijah. One of the main conflicts many Wastelanders know about is the Battle of Helios I. When Elijah and his troops arrived in the Mojave, only to discover that the NCR had taken Hoover Dam, Elijah became fixated on Helios I. 
The Brotherhood of Steel wasted no time in setting up camp there, as well as catching the attention of the NCR. The New California Republic sought control of Helios I to further establish their presence in the Wasteland, as well as a handful of other reasons. Despite this desire, Elijah and his Brotherhood refused, and spent around two years fighting off NCR attempts to gain access to the plant. After two whole years of warfare, the New California Republic executed Operation Sunburst, which was the strategic strike on Helios I to finally win it from the Brotherhood of Steel's heavy defense. Where the Brotherhood had the technology, the NCR had numbers, which whittled down the Brotherhood's defenses slowly before forcing them into a full retreat, resulting in Elijah completely disappearing. By 2281, the Helios I facility is under tight control of the NCR, and with the Brotherhood of Steel cowering away in the Hidden Valley bunkers, wasting away after their soul-crushing defeat. Jumping back east, and an entire decade after the Enclave's capital wasteland sector were wiped off the map, the Brotherhood of Steel on the east coast were at their strongest once again. Under the command of headstrong Arthur Maxon, who reunited the disgruntled outcasts and Lions Brotherhood of Steel to create an army true to both causes, a portion of this chapter headed to the Commonwealth in their airship constructed at Adams Air Force Base. This was after Paladin Dance of Recon Squad Gladius detected advanced signals and frequencies coming from the mysterious and unreachable faction naming themselves the Institute. The Institute had made themselves known to the Capital Wasteland as a very poorly kept secret, with a doctor who was looking for a rogue android. The Brotherhood of Steel most likely recognized the name, and knew of their android creations and capabilities. That is dangerous technology the Brotherhood must want, and so the crew of the Pridwin wasted no time in setting course for Boston Airport. According to some people I met a while back, this group of Brotherhood soldiers managed to rebuild Liberty Prime and get some ways of locating the Institute via their own synths and a lot of chasing cold trails. Liberty Prime allegedly blew a massive crater into the Institute, allowing the Brotherhood to access the Forbidden Faction's lair. It's unknown to me if this is true or not, or whether they were victorious. I've extensively covered the various missions of the chapter of Brotherhood sent to DC in my previous holotapes, so if you need more information, be sure to go and view them. For those who need to catch up, the Brotherhood of Steel had many missions on their shoulders that they were tasked with from the Lost Hills in California. Primary objectives included the recovery of technology to the east and the location of the rumored super mutant threat. Upon contacting and entering a war with the mutants, a large portion of Brotherhood saw this extermination to protect the wasteland as a waste of men and a waste of resources. They thought that if they spent more time collecting technology for them to use against the mutants, they would be more powerful in the end. Attacking the mutants first and foremost in these members' eyes would cause the capital wasteland Brotherhood to fall. These thoughts caused the members to have doubt in Elder Lion's capabilities as a leader, and they would watch his every move for the next 20 years. In 2276, the relationship between these disgruntled members and their Elder finally reached its limit, when Elder Lions repeatedly refused their request to seize and recover tech from Fort Independence, a military base which was populated by raiders. This made these members snap, in which they forcefully raided the Citadel's armory and took whatever they may need to survive and possibly thrive in the wastes, before making their ascent to the exit. Not in any war or battle, had Elder Lions lost such a large number of his men before. It broke him. As they walked from the Citadel's entrance, other members saw them as traitors, their betrayers, as outcasts. One of these names stuck with them, and they wore it like a scar caused by a deathclaw in the heat of battle, in which the inflicted emerged victorious. The outcasts began their warpath through the capital wasteland under the command of Paladin Henry Kasdan, their primary target was Fort Independence, a facility that a large portion of these outcasts had their eye on for some time. The extravagant arsenal that the outcasts had ripped from the weakened arms of the Brotherhood made ruthlessly short work of the raiders and critters that inhabited the fort, before completely taking it over and using Fort Independence as their headquarters. 
Shortly after taking over Fort Independence, Paladin Kasdan and the other outcasts began to draft up their new faction, including a name, a ranking system, and more. We shall first take a look at the name and ranking system of these outcasts. As I mentioned before, the remaining Brotherhood of Steel members back at the Citadel referred to these defects as many different things, but one term that stuck out to the group was the term Outcasts. The group decided that this is what they would name themselves. The Outcast symbol is a red sword with a single large gear surrounding the centre of the blade. The connotations of this logo are unknown, but when compared to the original Brotherhood logo we can see that a lot of representation of the various ranks of the Brotherhood are missing. Two gears as well as the wings and the circle are gone, which represented the Elder, Initiate and the Scribe, whereas a single gear, the Knight, and the sword, the Paladin, remain. While this can be explained with the obvious ranking system change, perhaps it has some further meaning not many know. We may never find out if this symbol has any deeper meaning or not. To differentiate themselves from the DC chapter of Brotherhood, the Outcasts painted their armour red and black, a very cool combination if you ask me. The reasoning for these specific colours is unknown, but using colour psychology, the black may resemble the power that the Outcasts hold, as well as sadness and anger at the Brotherhood of Steel as not all members hated their brothers, and some were quite regretful of their decision to leave. The red could symbolise the danger that the outcast enemies were in if they saw this power armour, their courage, or their warring nature. There are far fewer ranks in the outcast system than the brotherhoods, as there are less roles to fulfil. The common grunt of the outcasts is named the Defender. They are the most commonly encountered foot soldiers of the outcasts, usually seen on patrols, sieges, or defending a location such as Fort Independence. The specialists are the Eggheads, a counter to the Brotherhood scribe. With this description, we can already tell that the specialist role is one heavily focused on engineering, science, and technology. Finally, the Protectors are the Elders of the outcasts, however play a role more similarly to that of Sentinels. They are commonly commanding their soldiers in fortified positions and directing entire chapters of outcasts. The outcasts specifically try to retain the original Brotherhood of Steel values from back west, placing technology at the top of their priorities. This meant patrols were common and were usually rooted near vaults, old military bases and more. Protectors usually schemed to plan outposts at key locations throughout the wasteland so they could take more advanced tech and spread their influence instead of having to travel all the way back to Fort Independence to deliver said tech. With the original Brotherhood values still flowing through their veins, the Outcasts also held some of the more sour beliefs of the Brotherhood. They typically looked down on the people of the wasteland, seeing them on the level of animals who do nothing but get in the way. This distrust and dislike of outsiders was present in a well-known outcast mission that saw them establish an underground base where a VR pod lay. This VR pod was a military-grade simulation that would kill anyone if they died in the game. It required a pit boy to enter, so none could crack it open until a vault dweller happened to stumble in one day. During this mission, Defender Sibley saw Protector McGraw as growing soft for allowing an outsider to work with his outcasts and have a share of the technology in which the outcasts were rightfully owned, in which combat swiftly broke out. The Brotherhood of Steel's distrust of those outside of their walls was still present, even within those who became an outcast, to the point they were willing to kill their superiors to stop outsiders from claiming what was rightfully theirs. No matter what these outcasts called themselves, they were Brotherhoods of Steel to the bone. The Outcasts largely stayed out of war with any other factions, including where they had once come from. When the Enclave showed up, the Outcasts made sure to wipe the odd patrol out, if not for the good of the Wasteland, for their tech at least. Apart from the small encounters with the Enclave every now and then, the Outcasts did not do much to help the Brotherhood with their problems with both Enclave and the Super Mutants, instead keeping to themselves and watching from the shadows. Little is known about what the Outcasts were up to after the Enclave's defeat, but it is known that a young Elder, Arthur Maxon, managed to make peace between the Outcasts and the Brotherhood of Steel once again in 2283, later inducting them back into the Brotherhood of Steel to make a stronger faction, and reunite the Lost Brothers and Sisters with their families. Finally, the Outcasts could rest peacefully, knowing they would be listened to as members of the Brotherhood once again under the headstrong leadership of a man they trusted to bring the Brotherhood to glory once again. I have met many people on my adventures, characters from all different backgrounds.
from lands both on my doorstep and far, far away. A handful of these people were survivors from the Enclave, which, considering my own background, I am sure is of no surprise to you, Traveller. Deserters, ex-soldiers left for dead on the battlefield, each one swearing the same flag I did many years ago. While some were unwilling to share much about the atrocities they had once been a part of, others had stories to tell. Some were more tame, some were... horrifying. One that stuck out to me was a survivor from the Capital Wasteland, who told a tale of their time stationed at the Jefferson Memorial, when in the distance what seemed to be a small squadron of Brotherhood of Steel soldiers emerged from the smoke of a fallen vertebrate. At first, this seemed like an easy objective to the soldier and her teammates. That was until a loud clanking sound could be heard behind the soldiers of steel, and a giant silhouette faded into view. Gigantic laser beams fired from the creature's eyes, vaporizing her teammates in a matter of seconds. She swiftly jumped into the water to survive the onslaught, as the monster exclaimed anti-communist propaganda. Democracy is non-negotiable. They called it Liberty Prime, a hero to the Brotherhood, but to the Enclave and anyone who was considered an enemy of the Brotherhood of Steel, a marauder, a monster, death incarnate. I never got to see this mechanical monstrosity in action, thankfully, but I'm sure that you don't like the idea of having giant blue eye lasers that can vaporize you in seconds shot at you, or nuclear warheads thrown directly at your feet like it's the Great War all over again as much as I don't. With that, my name is The Wanderer, and this is the story of Liberty Prime. Commencing tactical assessment. Red Chinese threat detected. To truly understand a threat, and overcome its fear factor, one must look to its origins. For this, I take you back to a time before the Wasteland as we know it, the 2060s. Peace became a very distant memory, as tension between China and America grew ever tighter. America moved a large military presence to Anchorage, Alaska, out of fear of China invading after they had almost completely conquered the Pacific Ocean. What America feared, happened. China began their invasion of Alaska using drone-like robots and highly advanced tanks. America fought valiantly, whilst military companies like West Tech scrambled to get game-changing support such as the T-51B Power Armor finished and ready for deployment. During this time, General Atomics, Robco, and the United States government met to discuss another possible playing card they could add to this shitshow of a caravan game. A gigantic, nearly indestructible robot that could step on Chinese soldiers over the barricades and trenches that the US Army resided in, as well as fire lasers and throw nuclear warheads. The perfect soldier, a counter to the tanks and drones that were causing the valiant troops of America a large amount of casualties on the field. Work began sometime in the following years after plans had been fully realized, and although the robot was able to walk, talk, and stomp on objects, its scientific mumbo-jumbo which enabled it to use its lasers and warheads were offline, as it was consuming a lot of energy to operate properly. This would take a lot of time to fix, and ultimately, was never solved. Instead, America resorted to using various other methods to drive the Chinese off their soil. The T-51B Power Armor Project, the T-45 Power Armor Project, and a large arsenal of weapons were only some of these. There were heavy losses on both sides. But America managed to push the Chinese away from invasion without the aid of Liberty Prime. This was just the beginning, however, and by 2077, everything came to an end. Attention citizens, nuclear strike imminent. Please exit the area at your earliest convenience. Thank you for your cooperation. As the world fell into an atomic apocalypse, so did any hope of this General Atomics and Robco partnership project going anywhere. Left disassembled in a pile of parts in the lower levels of the Pentagon building in Washington DC to collect the dust and ash of the new world. In the 2250s, nearly 200 years after the Sino-American War had ended, a chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel was sent east from their origin site in California. 
They were sent east for a multitude of reasons and objectives, all of which I covered in my previous entries into this series. It's amazing just how far the Brotherhood came from Broken Hills, through Legion-occupied land, uncharted and irradiated valleys, all just to find the jewel that cried for help. The Capital Wasteland. The Brotherhood found an excellent site to settle in at the Pentagon, now named the Citadel by its inhabitants. As the Brotherhood began to settle in and discover more of this place they had found, the scribes travelled into the basement to find a large, disassembled robot. This robot was Liberty Prime, the joint General Atomics and Robco project that, due to a multitude of issues, remained unfinished and unusable during the war that raged 200 years beforehand. Elder Lions and the scribes saw this robot as not just a tool to utilise, or a pile of scrap to use for parts to maintain their arsenal. Liberty Prime was hope. Hope for the Brotherhood's might. Hope for the Wasteland. By 2277, this robot had been fully placed back together, and everything that the powers of the past had failed to fix were finished by the Brotherhood with the help of a local genius named Dr. Lee. Despite being not ready for field testing just yet, the Brotherhood were confident in their metal giant, and held out hope to see him in action soon. Those wishes would come true when the Brotherhood were thrusted into yet another war on Washington DC soil. Just as the Super Mutants were maintaining their status as the big green marauders in the Capital Wasteland, the Enclave had reared its ugly head once again. Despite not directly fighting the Enclave back west, the Brotherhood knew of them, and knew a lot about them as well considering how much spying they did. This time around, it was the Brotherhood of Steel's responsibility to take care of these genocidal remnants of the US government, and they had just the right tool for the job. When the time came to take back the Jefferson Memorial from the Enclave and save Project Purity, the Lone Wanderer, Lion's Pride, and Liberty Prime stormed their way to the memorial, fighting many Enclave soldiers and vertebrates as they went. Despite the Enclave's desperate efforts to stop the Brotherhood of Steel, they proved no match for the Brotherhood's big metal friend. Liberty Prime proved successful in the Brotherhood's first proper use in a firefight, and so he was kept in active duty after the purifier was successfully started and taken over, going from place to place with a large squad of Brotherhood soldiers, fighting Enclave remnants, muties, raiders, and whatnot. The Brotherhood were a force to be reckoned with so long as this Liberty Prime was under their command, with the Lone Wanderer reawakening after a two-week coma from the Purifier incident, the Vault Dweller was sent with the Brotherhood of Steel and Liberty Prime to take out yet another Enclave Remnant location, an old satellite array through the Rockland Car Tunnel, which the Enclave had got operational. This proved to the Brotherhood that the Enclave, despite being without a president or a colonel since Autumn went MIA, were reasonably organised through the chaos, keeping contact with other Enclave survivors and outposts through the wasteland. The Brotherhood had their work cut out for them, alright. Liberty Prime, accompanied once again by the Brotherhood and the Lone Wanderer, began to storm the satellite array, making short work of the squads of Enclave's troopers and the turrets in their path. Prime and the soldiers made it very close to the entrance, until they came across an obstruction in their path. As Prime began to process how to take down the wall in front of them, an orbital strike of all things was shut down from the heavens at the robot, destroying him. The Brotherhood of Steel took a heavy blow after the robot was destroyed, and without Liberty Prime, the Enclave could easily retake the upper hand in this war. The missile strike shattered Liberty Prime into pieces, his head, legs and arms broken off and mangled beyond repair. It would take years for the Brotherhood to repair the damage dealt here, but one thing was for sure, the mission must continue. The Enclave must be stopped. Within the next decade, things within the Brotherhood began to shift once more. The inner workings that founded the Capital Wasteland chapter's mission began to fade, and before long the Brotherhood of Steel were back to their traditional ways under Elder Arthur Maxon, a young and headstrong leader. With the outcasts reinducted into the fold after Maxon's traditional views on the original Brotherhood faith were evident, the discovery of the T-60C power armor and the completion of the Pridwin, the Brotherhood of Steel set a new objective. After having scouts and recon squads report concerning things from Massachusetts, their new goal was to reach an institute in the Commonwealth, which was allegedly a large scientific division who had the power to create androids. After more information is shed about this mysterious institute, 
the Brotherhood began to conquer the Commonwealth by taking military checkpoints and harvesting all technology needed to break the Institute. After realizing there is no real way in, apart from teleportation, Elder Maxon chooses upon his new outsider to assist his proctors and scribes into the fixing of their old robot friend. Liberty Prime is repaired, and he is used to blast a hole into the Institute and finally end the war against them. After the war is won, Liberty Prime was used at Boston Airport to watch over the Brotherhood of Steel and scare away any foes and possible infiltrators. This is the last known piece of information on Liberty Prime. Little is known about Elijah's early life as a young man. One can presume he was raised alongside most original Brotherhood of Steel members in Lost Hills, where as an initiate he trained to be a scribe. This is the first illogical and miraculous part of Elijah's long tale, as the Brotherhood of Steel only ever promoted paladins to Elder, a rank obtainable only to knights. Throughout his early life, Elijah displayed such a genius and knowledge that he outshone his fellow scribes. Rumor has it, Elijah could simply look at a piece of technology, such as a Pip-Boy or Terminal, and understand its inner workings within a matter of seconds. He truly was the brightest spark among the Brotherhood's scribes, with a genius that would score him greatly in the future. Elijah's beliefs were something the Brotherhood disapproved of. Instead of preservation and safeguarding, Elijah wanted to expand on old world technology, build bigger and better and stronger, as well as a splash of unethicality. This attitude towards the technology of the Brotherhood of Steel saw countless debates and disagreements among his peers, especially fellow elders when he was bestowed the rank. Elijah was so passionate about his beliefs to develop new and questionable weapons that the Brotherhood of Steel's elders grew tired of him and sent him with a new chapter to the Mojave Wasteland in search of technology the Brotherhood could research, retake, and preserve. One can only imagine the look on a knight's face as they were dispatched on a pilgrimage with their fellow chapter under the command of Elijah, someone whose views were deemed heresy by many Brotherhood conservatives. Despite many of the members' disapproval of Elijah and his leadership and beliefs, they believed in their mission, to investigate the Hoover Dam and make it fully operational and defend the location whatever the cost. To the disappointment of the entire Brotherhood of Steel, the new California Republic had already claimed the dam as their turf, meaning Elijah's mission was over, considering the NCR and Brotherhood of Steel aren't exactly best buds. Instead, Elijah turned his focus to Helios I and completely ignored the dangerous expansion of the Van Graaff family. Throughout his time as Elder, up to the Battle of Helios I, Elijah displayed his true visage to the Brotherhood of Steel members under his command. A non-caring control freak who saw his soldiers and scribes as nothing more than disposable equipment to get the job done. Elijah also adopted a bizarre way of communication with his chapter, refusing to communicate in person and instead via an array of terminals and intercoms, with only one person having a direct communication and connection with him. Her name was Veronica, and she was Elijah's pupil. Veronica had grown up in Lost Hills. Her father was a paladin, and her mother was a scribe, who both died during the same battle between the NCR and Brotherhood, leaving Veronica without parents as a young child. This is where Elijah stepped in taking a parental role and having a passion for educating Veronica, leading to Veronica looking up to Elijah as her old man. Elijah's teachings bestowed some of his qualities within her, such as his knowledge and genius, as well as his way of questioning the Brotherhood's dogmatic beliefs. During her time in Lost Hills, she fell in love with another woman, which was frowned upon by a lot of other members due to their incestuous beliefs of keeping the bloodlines pure and within the Brotherhood of Steel. With Veronica dating another woman, this meant there was no way for the pair to have children unless other men were involved. Elijah was one of these people who frowned upon their relationship. Using his power and influence within the Brotherhood of Steel, he caused the pair to break up, instilling the belief in Veronica that her partner had left the Brotherhood of Steel altogether, a lie that Veronica would never discover the truth about. Little did she know, her lover was assigned a role within the Circle of Steel, but despite being a part of the Brotherhood still, the pair would never see each other again. 
Unfortunately for Elijah, however, this decision would put himself in the crosshairs of Veronica's ex-girlfriend in the future. Veronica would join Elijah in going to the Mojave, becoming one of Elijah's most prized assets and being sent on various missions by him. This was the result of Elijah's power-mad manipulation once again, managing to coerce the elders into giving him permission to bring her along at his request. Veronica's views on Elijah would begin to slip as they approached Helios 1. Noticing his character flaws, the manipulative and power-hungry attitude, his treatment of his soldiers. She slowly noticed him slip into obscurity as he waged war on the NCR for two full years, resulting in the Battle of Helios 1. The NCR, initiating Operation Sunburst, ruthlessly hurled their numbers, artillery and everything they had at the Brotherhood of Steel as they tried to defend Helios 1. In the end, the Brotherhood of Steel were unsuccessful, amassing a critical number of casualties and falling back. Helios 1 was lost. The NCR moved to take control of the site while what remained of the Mojave Brotherhood of Steel fell back to the Hidden Valley Bungas, under the command of a new elder, Nolan McNamara, as Elijah had disappeared, fleeing before the battle even began. Throughout his leadership, he sent paladins on strategically questionable missions to retrieve technology he thought would sway the tides of the war, as it was as clear as Agua Pura that the Brotherhood of Steel were on the losing side of the conflict. Elijah stubbornly placed his bets on time to get the Archimedes II laser operational, but unfortunately for him, that time was up. Elijah's stubborn and psychotic nature was the reason so many Brotherhood of Steel soldiers fell during that battle, and without even a shred of guilt, he walked the sands of the Mojave. Elijah may have left the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel to die, but he still believed in his quest to find new technologies and return to save the Brotherhood of Steel from certain doom at the hands of the NCR. With Elijah's insatiable hunger for unethical weapons and technology to win against the NCR, he began his journey across the wasteland, travelling to various places of notoriety and interest in the Mojave, notable of which was the Divide. Even more notably, Elijah stumbled across the Big Mountain facility, which was Elijah's gold mine. His wishes to find technology with the means to save the Brotherhood had come true. All he had to do was enter the Big Empty. The Coalition of Brains and Jaws, otherwise known as the Doctors of Big Mountain, captured Elijah, but he was able to escape swiftly, much to the surprise of the Doctors. This escape left Elijah a giddy child in a sandbox full of dangerous technology. All he had to do was explore the great expanses of Big Mountain's wondrous terrain to find what he was looking for. While exploring this grand treasure trove, Elijah discovered another traveler in the area, a courier named Ulysses a character integral to the backstory of another courier I travelled with many moons ago. Ulysses acted as a catalyst to Elijah, telling him the legend of a place named the Sierra Madre. The Sierra Madre is nothing more than a place for travellers to die, a tomb for wanderers and treasure hunters seeking more than their wasteland life at a heavy cost, filled with the stench of the dead and even undead, with ghost people roaming the grounds, a crimson fog clouding the city of gold, and plenty of highly advanced old world technology as well as the treasure of your dreams. Technology. Elijah had his interest piqued. He would soon begin preparing for his pilgrimage to the Sierra Madre, this city of the dead, and parted ways with Ulysses. To prepare for what was to come, Elijah, while dealing with the side effects of Mentat's abuse, traversed the Big Empty to a location named Little Yangtze, a Chinese prisoner of war camp set up before the war so that Big Mountain scientists could experiment on the prisoners. Elijah went here to toy with the inmates on their bomb collars to manipulate and control the frequency. During this process, he also discovered a faint and bizarre radio signal, which he multitasked and fine-tuned. Has your life taken a turn? Do troubles beset you? Has fortune left you behind? If so, the Sierra Madre Casino, in all its glory, is inviting you to begin again. Come to a place where wealth, excitement, and intrigue await around every corner. Stroll along the winding streets of our beautiful resort. Make new friends, or rekindle old flames. Let your eyes take in the luxurious expanse of the open desert, under clear, starlit skies. Gaze straight on into the sunset from our villa rooftops. Countless diversions await. Gamble in our casino. Take in the theater, 
or stay in one of our exclusive executive suites that will shelter you and cater to your every whim. So if life's worries have weighed you down, if you need an escape from your troubles, or if you just need an opportunity to begin again, join us. Let go and leave the world behind at the Sierra Madre Grand Opening this October. We'll be waiting. This radio signal was none other than the Sierra Madre's siren song, the voice of a long-dead Vera Keys calling out to those who may hear her call with the location of the Sierra Madre, a place to begin again. Despite this journey being long and perilous, Elijah was more than prepared to brave the ways to the casino to get his means of defeating the new California Republic and not saving the Brotherhood, as why would one want to save the people that misunderstood you and didn't agree with you when you could just make the entire Mojave your own? Despite Elijah raring to embark on this journey, it seemed his past actions were beginning to catch up to the crazy old man, as the glimmer of a sniper scope was seen in the distance. This sniper was none other than an operative sent from the Circle of Steel. Elijah, knowingly or not, had left a trail after he had deserted the Brotherhood at Helios 1. A trail of actions and crimes that all the Brotherhood had to do was follow, which they did without hesitation. Elijah, no matter his intentions, must be stopped. This is where the Brotherhood of Seal deployed Circle of Steel operative Christine Royce to hunt down and eliminate the rogue elder. Christine, ironically, was Veronica's past lover before Elijah manipulated their separation unbeknownst to them both. Whether she knew it or not, the actions of history and pure fate had led to this very moment. Christine, using her eagle-eyed vision and brilliant mind, put the pieces together to chase Elijah down to Big Mountain, and she had him right in her sights right where she wanted him. Despite her best efforts and incredible journey to find him, Elijah caught her scent. He detonated the prisoner of war collars to fight off the wave of security robots heading both his and Christine's way, collected his belongings, and fled the scene. During this attack by Big Empty Security, Christine found herself injured by the robots, where she was taken to the Y-17 medical facility for processing. Christine had been defeated and taken for cruel experiments by the Big Empty medical staff, her brain was damaged to a critical degree. She could no longer read or write, and it could have been far worse if it were not thanks to Ulysses, who detonated most of the facility to save her. Christine's hunt for Elijah was further put to a halt as she recovered in a nearby cave under the protection of Ulysses. Eventually, after Christine had discovered and acquired a Mark I stealth suit, replacing her Brotherhood armor which still lies in Big Empty, she continued her hunt for the Rogue Elder. Little did she know, Big Mountain was only the beginning of the pain she was experiencing. Nothing could prepare her for what was waiting for her at the Sierra Madre. While Christine was out of action after the robot's attack, Elijah made several more camps across the surface of the Big Empty, before manipulating the old world tech in the area to mess with some of the Big Mountain staff, such as Dr. Aid's voice and using Dr. O's processors to control the network of trains in the area, sending one crashing into a tunnel, which was an entrance and exit to Big Mountain. Elijah's escape from Big Mountain was complete, Sierra Madre bound with a dangerous worldview of domination. While his original plan was to save the Brotherhood of Steel from certain doom at the hands of the NCR, plans change. He would utilize the Sierra Madre and her technology to take the Mojave and the Wasteland for himself, and nothing could get in his way. With the Sierra Madre in sight, Elijah used an abandoned Brotherhood of Steel bunker as an outpost while he went back and forth from the casino studying a strange cloud and the surface level technology he could get his hands on before entering fully. It was here that he left a message for Veronica in the event he did not return from his escapades into the Sierra Madre, a message which would presumably fall on deaf ears. Finally, the time had come. Elijah stepped past the gates of the Sierra Madre and was met with his Crimson Wonderland, a treasure trove even greater than the one offered at Big Mountain. This was spectacular to him technology to save the wasteland, technology to conquer it. Hologram soldiers with the potential to become one-man armies were a fascinating discovery for Elijah, but most fascinating of all was the vending machines dotted across the resort. These vending machines had the capability of turning the casino chips of the casino into usable items, such as food and medicine, as well as acting as a ration station in the event of a nuclear apocalypse. To Elijah, these machines were the key to beginning a new nation, a new world order built in the image of his ideals. 
with a holographic, near-invincible military to squish those who oppose him, and the utilization of these machines to make bomb collars to ensure the compliance of civilians, and the cloud to poison those who do not embrace it as it grows past the Mojave. Elijah was to become more than just a rogue elder. He was destined for dictatorship. But, to become a ruling force, he was going to need help, willing or not. For this, he used the misguided hunters and travelers who dared step foot in the Sierra Madre, attacking the first person he found and slapping a bomb collar on them, enabling his power over them. He would then use this slave as a domino. They would catch the next person, and the person after that, until Elijah had successfully assembled a task force of slaves to do his bidding. One of the great draws to the Sierra Madre was the rumor of its high-value loot and treasure within the walls, a treasure which most of the people Elijah had captured sought after, which caused selfish infighting and hours, days, and weeks of progress lost as they began to turn on each other. This process was incredibly tiresome and frustrating for the soon-to-be dictator, but this heavy burden was slightly alleviated by the arrival of a super mutant, a nightkin, one who was willing to do his bidding without question. Dog, as the Nightkin was called, would make the capture of potential candidates far swifter and easier. So Elijah set up the broadcast station for the Sierra Madre to lure those who search for its source to his bunker, where a poison cloud trap would knock naive fools who dared follow the signal unconscious, giving Dog the opportunity to transport them to the Sierra Madre. With this new system in place, Elijah continued his attempts to use his captives to crack open the Sierra Madre's casino and eventually its vault, so he may begin his new world. Eventually, Christine, who was still tracking Elijah, was captured by Dog and enslaved. The very man she was sent to hunt was now her master. Sometime shortly after her capture, she was trapped in one of the Sierra Madre's auto docks by another slave and former inhabitant of the Sierra Madre, Dean Domino and gruesomely dissected. Christine was left with her vocal cords torn out. Yet another horrific science experiment was initiated for two weeks straight on the Circle of Steel operative. With the capture and arrival of a courier I once traveled with years ago, which is how I'm telling you this story now, Elijah was successful in his attempts to open the casino doors by using Christine, who was freed from the autodoc at the cost of claustrophobia, Dog, Deem Domino, and the courier. It was with this band of slaves that Elijah was successful in reaching the Sierra Madre's vault, their fates unknown. One fate that was sealed, however, was Elijah's. His lust for power in a new world order left him blind to the fact that the Sierra Madre was a trap for Dean Domino, set by the creator of the casino many centuries ago. After a final showdown in the vault of the Sierra Madre, Elijah soon called this vault a tomb of his own, a place where the key to starting his vile plan was right in front of him, but he was trapped there with it, unable to escape, unable to begin again. While Christine's fate was not made clear to me, one could say that her mission was a success. Elijah, one way or another, was doomed. The Sierra Madre was his coffin, and the courier, his nail. Veronica would sadly never discover the fate of Elijah, nor meet or hear from Christine again, left in the dark, oblivious to these events. While one could wish for the pair to be reunited after Elijah's meddling was put to a much-deserved end, not every story has a happy ending.